we're going to give a prize um, for some of the best posters. And we thought um, England had been to a, a, a similar kind of event before, and the students also chose a best poster. And we thought that would be quite a fun thing to do. So it's anonymous, you don't give your name, and definitely don't vote for your own poster. <laughs> but if, say, by Thursday lunchtime, you could just give me the name of uh, the poster that you, um, you can write them all up with your sheet, and you can pass it around and you can just um, put, put your name um, on the poster, I'll hand you each little thing. Um, if, if you're keen to do that, yes. and then we'll, we'll award a poster selection. From the, uh, selected from the students. Um, there's also an evaluation form that I'd be keen for you to fill in. You know, we, try, we hold the summer school every two years and we like to try and improve the experience. So um, I, I'm going to print them out today so that you've got it, so that you don't kind of forget the lectures that you've heard. And if you just fill it in as you go and I'll collect them to you on Saturday.
So can I just have a show of hands of those of you who use Plankton models on a day-to-day -day basis? So I'm not going to bore the whole room to death if I actually do some Plankton modeling this afternoon. No? Okay, so I'll try and make some fun, something fun to do with Plankton for this afternoon. But apart from that, we can probably, unless there is some burning questions about any of yesterday's lectures at all, then we can probably just get a bit going this morning, given that, I don't know about you, but jet lag probably means you don't want to be working really late this evening on projects. We could probably get that stuff a bit earlier today as well. So the other, the other question I have, if we just kind of raise hands, how many people in the groups are actually going to, are intending to build a, a full-on model for that topic, or how far beyond the conceptual model are you going to go, are you going to use really complicated models? So who's intending to use like a, um, a vendor model, for instance, or a, have they got some model that they can grab that they've already got, that they can use? Uh, you guys have got a model that you've already got in terms of that. Um, for for our group, I think yes, we can. Um, I think we um, make sure we have things fairly simple enough so that we can do that. So, in that, the, probably in the corner over there, they, you guys were going to build a, a model as well. Yeah. So how many of you are going to use agent-based approach? Oops. So there's just two groups, three groups. Is anybody using, going to, intending to use any qualitative modeling? You haven't had a lecture about qualitative modeling yet, because it'll be on Thursday. Is anyone, are, are people familiar with qualitative modeling? Or? Just, just for your eyes. So that's it there. Wait until Thursday for that. Um, so anyone in, with respect to the topics, have you got any questions to any of the lecturers about the topics? Or that might be a benefit to the other groups as well? No? No question is the same. Okay. Um, as I said, we didn't really have a plan for this morning, so it was just a, a matter of sort of playing with my ear. But um, Aline, what do you... Yes, on the distance out. So for tomorrow, we, again, we have a half an hour of questioning. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and get something a bit more structured for the first half an hour, or even if you can work in your groups in the first half an hour, that would be good too. But if people are happy that we can start with the lectures this morning a little bit early and progress through the day a bit earlier, yeah? Live for this? Yeah. Okay. So what well, we figure to start, uh, since the concept was to uh, look at natural human interactions in the marine world, I thought I'll uh, spend some time looking at uh, what the human means, uh, especially in the evolutionary context and the evolution of Earth itself and its climate. And I'll just touch on sustainability. <clears throat> Essentially, this is more about how is it that human mind perceives risks and what does it mean if we want to do cognitive modeling of the human mind? So it's, I will say some things that may uh, be religiously offensive, but <laughs> let's hope that nobody brought any bombs. Um, actually, Beth gave a nice opening uh, for introducing mind talk yesterday. She said, uh, ozone hole gives us a, a, a positive uh, or a hopeful message for how we would deal with uh, climate change. But can somebody quickly say what is the difference between, what could be uh, a difference between the ozone hole problem and the global warming problem? Yeah. Maybe the feedback starts in the process. Okay, but just thinking in terms of humans, uh, ozone hole, there were probably going to be no winners. Everybody was going to lose, right? So it was easier to get together and make an agreement to say we need to close the hole. Whereas in global warming, it's hardly clear that uh, everybody will lose. In fact, for a while, unless there's a catastrophic failure, it's possible that there will be winners and there will be losers. And this has already been happening 
uh, if you look at uh, some of the numbers, which uh, I will show. So, uh, I will start by using uh, Uh, I will start by using this example of how a uh, human mind uh, tries to deal with problems. So this is uh, rainfall from a village in India where I work uh, for summer of 2011, uh, where I had taken 15 students from the U.S. to teach them sustainability and for the bad uh, trout, this year is even worse. And it gets about 400 millimeters of rain per year, which is like New Mexico, for example. So it's um, but it used to be distributed very nicely from about end of May, beginning of June through September. And in the last 10 to 20 years, it has become very patchy like this. This is daily rainfall. So there was just a little bit of rainfall in June, uh, July got uh, some rain, uh, end of July, and then there was a huge cyclone uh, in October that uh, brought rain. The village has been around since about the 4th century, so they have dealt with this amount of rain that uh, basically uh, sustained agriculture uh, this long. But this makes it very difficult. If it doesn't rain in June, they lose their basic protein uh, called the green gram or uh, moved out. And this year it didn't even rain in July, so they lost the second crop, which is uh, onions and uh, uh, peppers and uh, so on, and if it still rains in July, they can get uh, some wheat and cotton, maybe corn, uh, later in uh, October and November. So uh, the idea that we are trying to introduce there is something called agroforestry, which is a sustainable agricultural method, I won't go into it, and some farmers have adopted it and they have become drought resistant, uh, and the farmers sitting right next to them see that this method works, but they still would not uh, adopt it, they don't jump on it. So what is it that makes human mind resist uh, change even when it is obvious that they need to change and that it would be good for them, right? So people tend to have what are called mental models and um, so essentially this you can look in, in the notes that you will get uh, says how people think uh, of themselves and of others. So an undergraduate sees, sees himself as Einstein, sees a PhD student as somebody who would be force-fed, sees a postdoc as rich, making a lot of money, sees a professor as Jesus, and a technician as basically a mother, and so on. So people have mental models of pretty much everything. So when you propose something to them, it is this mental model that often becomes a problem to accept change or to even accept new information. So the main message is really that even if you have solid science about global warming or whatever it is about how to be sustainable in agriculture, be drought proof and so on, it's not so easy to get people to act on it. And this works also for biodiversity. For example, people are struggling to explain to people that biodiversity is getting seriously affected by human activities and one of the approaches has been to say there is um, ecosystem services from biodiversity and that's, what, that's why we should preserve it. And Pat showed, uh, I think it's Bob Costanza's uh, uh, calculation that the ecosystem services from just the ocean itself is 39 trillion or whatever. And social science will tell you that actually human beings have what are called intrinsic values and extrinsic values. The intrinsic values are what make you stand up for a cause, care about families, uh, stand up for the environment, and everybody has intrinsic values. Extrinsic values are what are uh, basically related to making money, image, status, power, and so on. So everybody uh, has these intrinsic values and they can be reached, but you have to know how the human mind perceives messages. And the human mind, basically, Jonathan Haidt proposed uh, that as a kind of a split personality where it's got uh, an emotional elephant and a rational rider. So everybody has a rational side which tends to look at the problems, so thinks generally negatively, and can 
keep rationalizing forever and not make any decisions. Uh, whereas the emotional elephant is slow to move and hard to control, as you can see, the rider is much smaller compared to the elephant, and tends to get discouraged very easily. But once it makes a decision, identifies with something emotionally and starts moving, then it's hard to stop it, it keeps moving. So if uh, you want to communicate anything, then essentially you have to reach both the elephant and the rider. So how is it that the human mind evolved to be like this, to have a split personality? So you have to think of all the communication and the global warming and the engagement we're trying to do in this context because when you're communicating, like here I'm here giving you information, I'm not expecting you to change anything. If you learn from it, great. So I'm just giving you information. Whereas you could also be communicating to actually engage people to go clean uh, the park or uh, reduce pollution somewhere and so on. Or it could be to actually change their norms and behaviors. So you could be communicating for various reasons. And a lot of the uh, global warming communication thus far from scientists has focused on uh, telling the world that the global warming is bad, we are doing something bad. But scientists are not really good at communicating to the human mind. They think if you have information, that should be enough and you scream at people, you tell them the world is coming to an end and they'll jump up and start doing something about it. Well, that's not how it works. And you can see that this is uh, from uh, Jim Hansen, those of you know, know him. Uh, <clears throat> like Kevin Trentworth, he's one of the most vocal proponents of how bad global warming is. Uh, he writes books like this, Storms uh, of My Grandchildren, The Truth About uh, the Coming of Time, Cats, Growth, and the Last Chance to Save Humanity. As a scientist, even I don't agree with this kind of statement. This is too gloom and doom, too chicken little, right? And there's a new book called Our Dying Planet. Really? The planet will never die. Maybe humans will die, right? Biology will do just fine. So we have to be careful what we are saying. So the communication scientists, like uh, a fish off from Carnegie Mellon, have been looking at the psychology of communication of global warming. And he says very uh, diary that uh, People often have flawed intuition regarding how well they communicate, typically exaggerating their success. Right? In ordinary conversations, people receive feedback, but if I'm standing here, you may ask questions, but generally, I don't necessarily get a good feedback about it. So, scientists in general are not the best of uh, communicators. And the problem we are dealing with is, is also pretty complicated. How many of you have seen this curve before? Is there anybody who's never seen this? Is there anybody who's never seen this? Okay. This is called the healing curve, right? Well, you should see it as soon as possible. Right here. <laughs> so, it's been measuring carbon dioxide in Mauna Loa, and it shows the seasonal cycle and the continuous increase. And if you take out the trend, then you will see the El Nino and so on, the, the, the trend will very deep signal. But this is very precise, very accurate, and can be it, uh, no doubt that it's very accurate. And you have instrumental records. Now this is the global mean temperature. So there is the issue of how well it's covered, how well it represents the global mean, but this is fairly accurate and reproducible. Uh, the question is, can this be explained that each year is now having a new record of warm spring or warm winter or warm summer and so on with other extreme events? It's not that easy, especially because to understand this, you need to go through a lot of attribution and eliminate all the other potential causes like natural variability. And that's not always easy. So the attribution science gets very difficult. And especially because you need to know the climate sensitivity. If you increase CO2 by a certain amount, how much does that translate into uh, energy balance and uh, increase in temperature, especially global temperature. And the local temperatures get even more complicated because the temperature doesn't change uniformly everywhere. And this doesn't even matter because nobody lives in global mean temperature. So you then begin to look for longer uh, records of temperature. And this is going back to the beginning of the industrial uh, evolution. This is the temperature estimate. So you can see that uh, the uncertainties or the variability begins to increase. And the relation between the CO2 and temperature is not that obvious. So the problem itself is inherently complicated. So Normal people don't necessarily perceive the, the complexity.
complexity of the problem. You go even longer term using ice core uh, records, which tell you very clearly that uh, CO2 has been very on some time scales in the past. Methane has been very, and temperature has been very, I think yesterday uh, maybe Beth mentioned this. Uh, we know that in the past, or maybe Marcus did, uh, temperature has generally led because orbital changes happen, radiation or energy coming in changes, seasonal distribution, and so on. That starts the highest albedo feedback. Then you get a response in CO2 and methane. And what we are doing now is reversing the problem. We are increasing CO2 quite rapidly, larger than uh, anything we've seen in the last 20 million years, maybe even 60 million years. And we've increased methane. You have to be careful. The scales here are parts per billion and this parts per million. So the temperature has not increased yet. And this is what is called committed warming. So even if we stop emitting carbon right there, temperature will eventually reach this relation and then it will jump up because the ocean will start bringing back and so on. So the essential science we have <clears throat> behind global warming is very solid, but to explain it to people is not that easy. So we have to be really aware of that instead of always screaming. So now you take that kind of information and you try to project it on impacts. You want to show people that how climate is impacting biodiversity and so on. So this is from a UN report which says that uh, there are already 350,000 deaths per year uh, that are attributable to climate-related events. If we don't do anything, it could be about a million per year in about uh, by 2030, 20 years. Uh, and you have huge losses, and these are mostly developing countries, and the economic losses and financial losses are mostly the developed world. It's not surprising. But the fingerprinting and other techniques that go into attributing climate change to these kind of things is even more complicated than attributing CO2 change to temperature change and so on. So most, I would argue that most climate scientists don't even understand what kind of science is behind this. This is very rigorous, robust and so on, but there are so many models involved that you can't really explain to people how you did that. So the problem that you're dealing with is essentially that the facts are uncertain and increasing the knowledge doesn't necessarily reduce uncertainty and the values are in dispute. It depends on who is dealing with the problem and who wants to change what. So there are not always winners, but there are winners and losers. But the stakes tend to be high. Even if you don't believe this number, even if it's off by 100%, it's still a pretty large number. Right? Who is responsible for it? What's the value of life? So the decisions tend to be urgent. So you have to produce information and uh, deliver it to decision makers in a kind of uncomplicated way, in a timely manner, and it has to be usable. That's not always easy. As he already showed that, I won't go into it. The only smart thing Donald Trump probably ever said. But the human mind, as I said, is always doing risk perception. Whether you're eating dinner and deciding whether it should be low calorie or high calorie or whether you're going to indulge or not or whether you're buying a house, a car, whatever. You're always making decisions and you're create, you're calculating risk in some way. And for climate models or for climate prediction or for humans, uh, it, the risk perception can be uh, culture specific, gender specific and so on. And it's usually uh, described in this way where you have the knowledge for the users themselves, for example, if you're a climate modeler, you have a good sense of what the uncertainty is in the information you are giving. And the people who use this information, whether it's a bank or a government or, or, or whoever, often tends to take that information and make a decision basically by assuming it's true. So they, in some sense, reduce the uh, uncertainty that's actually in the information that's produced, that the information producers know. But if you're far away from it, like the individual user, they might think the uncertainty is much higher than what is being said by the people who produce the knowledge. So this tends to be called the uncertainty well, or often it's called the value of that, because to get the information from there to there, you have to get past this. And there are lots of examples of how a linear prediction is used by a bank uh, versus a government versus a fisherman. And so on. 
So this is kind of a, a, a schematic, but it seems to work all the time. So when you're communicating anything, you have to remember that. You have to get past this, this value of death uh, to get to human beings. And within that context, we're always trying to say we have to be sustainable, right? There are no real metrics, and sustainability is not a goal that you reach and say, okay, we are sustainable. It's a target. You're always aiming towards sustainability. And what does sustainability mean? The best you can do really is provide kind of a multiple statement. Uh, it's a truism, but how do you implement it, right? It's the ability of one generation to exploit resources without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to exploit the same resources. Makes perfect sense, but how do you convert it into any kind of norms, punishments, regulations, and so on? That's not so easy. So we will keep in mind that I'm going to basically provide a positive message saying that human beings, humans, are the most cooperative species, and I'll say how they got there or what that means, uh, and that if you look at the uh, long-term evolution, the human society has moved more and more towards cooperation. So even though at a given time it looks like everybody is killing everybody and the world is going to hell in a basket, and basket, whatever, actually it turns out that in a long time scale we are becoming more cooperative, more global, and so on. So that's where the, the big history in my title comes from. It was proposed by David Christian, who is a historian, who said, if you want to understand human mind, you have to essentially go all the way back to the Big Bang. So I'll touch on the Big Bang and try to say why that is. And this concept is also uh, kind of being promoted by people like Paul Ulrich, who is an uh, evolutionary biologist, and uh, Gellman, who is a uh, Nobel laureate in physics. And their idea is that to do this kind of synthesis of Earth system science, sometimes you have to skip the details and kind of take a, a very broad view and sacrifice that if necessary to synthesize the information. So I'm going to try to synthesize some aspects of evolution, look at how planets have interacted with evolution, what human being human beings in the context of evolution, and what that would mean for dealing with global warming, or in this case, modeling human interaction with the Right. right, so there is always a question of whether humans should be considered external or part of the ecology and so on, but we won't have uh, time to discuss that. So human beings have always been a cooperative species. This is an uh, image of uh, hunting uh, a whale, and there are evolutionary theories as to why human beings became so uh, cooperative. It turns out that if you go back a couple of hundred thousand years, uh, as human beings got better and better at building spears and uh, fishing rods and so on, they were basically trying to avoid visual theft. So if you're fishing, somebody can watch you, maybe get better than you and compete with you, or even how to compete. So it was easier to cooperate and work together than to hide all your talent, because some of you can steal it anyway. So I'll keep coming back to that. But they also have been sustainable in terms of being in harmony with their surroundings. So when they were hunter-gatherers, they uh, hunted big game and they shared it because you couldn't really store it for yourself for too long. And this is an image from Hawaii where the tribes had rules on how many fish you could catch. If you caught more than your quota, this, would, this is what would happen. So in the modern context, the question is who decides who makes the rules and how do we implement it? And there are lots of examples. Now you see Iran trying to build nuclear power. Right? That's what they want, but somebody is going to decide whether they can get it or not. So how do you justify these things? So that's what becomes a kind of an issue. So let's start with that. So human beings are basically social animals. We are always dealing with each other from a very young age. We put on uniforms to belong to a group or a team. We put on, you know, color on our faces and so on. So we have a need to belong to a culture, to a group a team, and so on. So where does that come from? So let's start just quickly with uh, the Big Bang. Big Bang, how many of you have heard of Big Bang? Has anyone you never heard of Big Bang? Never heard of Big Bang? I heard of it. I would say, how did we spend <laughs> But <laughs> so big, Essentially, if you take the universe that it exists now and integrate backwards, Everything comes to a point 
point and the density becomes so large that the physics we have now doesn't work. So it's essentially a singularity. And for all practical purposes, time started with the Big Bang. So we don't have a very good idea of what could have happened before. There are multiple ideas of uh, Big Bang itself. And we know from using my, uh, microwave uh, measurements and so on that it happened about 13.6 billion years ago and so on. So if you are a believer in God, you can say that God <coughs> made a world at that time, or 6,000 years, whatever. And if you're a scientist, you say, well, what was God doing before Big Bang? And as Stephen Hawking points out, St. Augustine would have said that God was busy creating hell for people who ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so Big Bang happened, so you started with muons and leptons, electrons, neutrons, protons. You have the Higgs field, <coughs> which creates the asymmetry. And very quickly, you, they merged, and you got the early uh, elements like hydrogen, and then helium, uh, lithium, and on to carbon. So all the essential elements of uh, life, like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, they all came into uh, place very quickly after the Big Bang. So the rules that got set since then are essentially gravity and the uh, second law of thermodynamics, which, you know, they work, but they don't give you any moral guidance as to how to deal with human problems like uh, global warming. And second law of thermodynamics works for life also, but gravity can locally create order. So second law of gravity, for those who don't, don't know it, is essentially always this order is increasing. Chaos is increasing. So if you have an energy gradient, the gradient tends to get smoothened and the energy is used to increase this order, right? And gravity can locally create order, so it seems to break the second law of thermodynamics uh, locally. And even life is argued to break the second law of thermodynamics because we consume energy and we create order. I'm standing here and talking after eating the breakfast that was energy in a, a more disorderly manner, right? So how do we then uh, go from there to life? So let's just zoom all the way down to the solar system, which got formed about 4.1 billion years ago or so, and we know that the Goldilocks syndrome essentially got solved in the sense that the climate of the Earth cannot really be uh, explained fully by just looking at um, the distance from the Sun, because the Venus is really hot, Mars is really cold, so we created this perfect planet which is suitable for life. But that doesn't mean that life doesn't exist elsewhere or that life doesn't exist on Mars. We just don't know, right? From what we know, uh, Earth has life as we know it, and even the moon, which is gravitationally trapped to Earth, uh, got formed at some point early on, where some planetoid crashed into Earth, took a chunk out, got trapped, and uh, has stabilized the Earth's orbit. Otherwise, Earth would be uh, wobbling uh, much more, uh, much faster than it is now in terms of the precession and uh, obliquity cycles. So even that could have helped life. So what is life in that sense, right? We don't know exactly where life started, but we know that once we had carbon and water and uh, uh, hydrogen uh, in the early atmosphere, even during the primordial soup, we started forming certain uh, polymers of carbon, and they had lots of properties which are essentially life. They can store energy, obviously. This is why we have the global warming they got fossil fuels and we burn them, they're essentially carbon compounds. And they have memory, they have certain plasticity. And they could reproduce themselves. So uh, in the sense that Altman checked, left RNA in a, uh, a petri dish for three weeks and it cleaved itself, right? So it's not life by itself, but it could reproduce itself. And water is essential, so we know that human body and all life is essentially mostly water. So, what is it that then went from the carbon polymer to life? So if you look at RNA and DNA, you have the basic nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, and you place it with uracil in RNA. And in fact, to uh, form DNA, you need the catalysts that are in RNA to synthesize the proteins. So you know that RNA probably came before DNA. So you need essentially basic building blocks like hydrogen, cyanide, and uh, alkanine, and so on, which would have been abundantly available in the primordial soup. They're not very special. 
But how did they exactly get organized this way? That's not very clear. Even now, if you take material from comets in space, deep space, uh, they do have the basic building blocks like amino acids. The only other thing that you need here is phosphate, which is not very easily explained, but meteorites called Schreberside has a, a, a compound called Schreberside, which is actually corroding easily in water. That could have released a lot of phosphate in the beginning. Okay? So, somehow, life got organized, went from RNA to DNA, and some small cells evolved, cyanobacteria, and the uh, best theory we have for how we went from prokaryotes to eukaryotes is by Lynn Margulis, which said it's some kind of a symbiotic assimilation. And it makes sense because if you look at mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts, they have their own DNA, they have their, their own branches on uh, the tree of life. So it's all likelihood that they were independent and they got assimilated. Somebody thought, hey, it would be cool to have plastic so I can produce my own. Uh, energy and then burning myself by taking up mitochondria. So soon you had multicellular life, more complex life, oxygen evolved, photosynthesis, and so on. So basically, you have Hadean, which is, comes from Hades in Greek, means hell, no life yet, as far as we know. Archaean, which is Archis at the beginning. Protozoic is early life, and then you have Phenerozoic, which is the visible life. So you have plenty of fossil evidence from uh, here on. So, looking at geologic evidence of reduced carbon, we know that life existed here. And you had either invertebrates, fish, amphibians, and so on. So, in this sense, human beings are essentially, you know, appear on Earth in the last fraction of a second, but we have dominated the Earth now. Does that mean we are doomed to destroy the Earth, like a virus that gets you cancer, or are we able to actually save it? Right? So, that's kind of the big question if you want to actually go and try to model uh, cognitive behavior. So let's try to kind of put that in, in context of a bit more of the evolution, try to see if human beings are different than other species and how are they different. So if you think of the evolution, is it lazy? Does it spend as little energy as possible? Or is it spending energy when uh, it's necessary? So they looked at lice in birds and the lice that's in the feather that get pecked, gets pecked by the bird actually has learned to camouflage itself. Whereas the lice that's on the head that doesn't get pecked has wasted no energy in camouflaging itself. And the other way here, same, this is in the head and this is in the, in the feather. So you would think that evolution is actually lazy, right? But if you look at reproduction, almost the majority of the species now reproduce sexually, right? Basically because asexual reproduction, you just go fission from one uh, cell to multiple cells. And this takes a long time to evolve a good mutation and keep it. In fact, a small deleterious mutation and it can get wiped out. So this is energetically very cheap, but in terms of long-term survival, it may not be so uh, useful. Competitive, it may not be so competitive. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, is very expensive. Just look at all the fancy dresses we buy, funny glasses we wear, right? We spend a lot of money in the uh, bars trying to woo the other sex and so on. So finding the, the, a partner and keeping the partner and getting the party to reproduce for you, that's a lot of energy. So evolution is not necessarily lazy when it is, but this is very uh, good in terms of competitiveness because you can keep quickly combine uh, uh, different sex, you know, two genders and produce good high fitness mutations much more quickly and you are evolutionarily much more competitive, right? So evolution does spend energy when it needs, but it tends to save energy when it doesn't have to spend it. So in that sense, it's not just the photosynthesis and the evolution of oxygen that created the planet as Earth evolved, mountains evolved, life has evolved, they have interacted with each other. But even the evolution of the human species itself from our ancestors has been shown to be mostly related to climate and climate change, right? So when we talk about stopping climate change, we are not really saying we want the climate to remain steady, but we don't want it to vary very wildly. We don't want it to go uncontrolled, right? 
not all the ice three sea levels and so on. So the old world, the new world monkey split around 28 million years ago. Around 10 million years ago, you started going from early hominids and hominids to, you know, like Arctic and Neanderthals. Around 3 million years ago, they split into uh, the Australopithecus and Paranthropus and the Homo lineage evolved around that time. And the critical climate change here was essentially that East Africa, where we know by using genetic methods uh, that that's where the uh, Homo sapiens and Homo erectus, the earliest, the closest relative that evolved. There are other uh, uh, controversies there about how the Neanderthals evolved, why they lived in cold climates, how did they go extinct, and so on and so on. But essentially around seven to five million years ago, East Africa used to be green, lush forests, so chimpanzees would walk you know, on all four legs. You don't have to go far to find food, and you don't have to run far from predators. But you went from what was a permanent El Nino-like transition in the Pacific. How many of you have heard of what El Nino is? How many who, is there anybody who's never heard of El Nino? <laughs> you heard of El Nino? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's heard of El Nino? If you have El Nino, then you have dry climate in some parts of Africa. If you went from permanent El Nino to variable El Nino, uh, you can change the rainfall patterns. They went from lush forests to grasslands uh, and savanna. And this is supposed to have made it harder for uh, quadrupeds, things that walk on all four legs, to get too far. So they eventually evolved to be more energetically efficient and move faster by being bipeds like us, who move on two legs. But along the way, over uh, the last couple of million years, Things have changed, a lot of things have changed. We have evolved symbolic language, uh, we have built tools more and more efficiently. And there's something called Baldwinian evolution, where if you start using your brain and your hands to do more precise instruments, actually the brain evolves, gets more precise, and even got cleaved and formed left handed and right handed brain, so you became ambidextrous the thumb evolved, and so on. So not everything can be explained, but it seems like along the way the diet changed, a lot of things changed, and it doesn't explain how the addition or the change in the structure happened, why our brains are bigger. But there is some evidence that evolution does happen uh, in a way that things jump from one state to other by accidental mutations. So I'll show an example of that. Yeah, I should have mentioned that here. Actually, the, the earlier theories of big brain were, uh, were basically assigned to the fact that uh, our ancestors went from eating raw meat and so on, which required strong jaws and strong muscles, to each, you know, once they got fired, they started eating cooked food and more fruits and vegetables and so on. Then the muscles relaxed and that allowed the cranium to grow. But it turns out that actually recently it was found that there are controller genes which control the side of the cranium and one of the controller genes was lost. And that's what made the cranium to suddenly grow bigger and the brain grew to occupy more space. But the brain is incredibly uh, metabolically expensive. When you're a baby, almost 60% of the food you eat goes into just maintaining the brain, keep the brain running. As you grow older, it takes about 25% if you're doing any work. If you're drinking and sleeping, then it's much less. Right, Marisha? So, such an accident also happened with something else. So this basically raises the question of what is it that gets replicated with time? Is it the chromosomes? Obviously not. I don't think there's anybody related here, so we don't necessarily share any chromosomes. So, Richard Dawkins has argued that it's the gene that gets carried with time is the gene that tries to survive. So we share a lot of genes, right? Marisha and I both have the gene for good looks. <laughs> Eileen and I both have the gene for intelligence. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't agree. So genes we share. So that's the basic unit that maybe gets replicated. But this has to replicate very precisely. If it doesn't, then you have accidents. And the example I can give you is a, a joke. I tell you. <laughs> uh, 
A young lady joins a convent to become a nun. Be careful, Don't send it to the Pope. Uh, I have a different joke for the Pope. <laughs> so she goes there and says she wants to be a nun, so the mother says, I'm not a Christian, so I don't, might be getting the uh, names wrong, but she says, you have to first go to the basement and copy the Gospels by hand. So she goes down and there's thousands of apprentices sitting and copying something. She goes to her desk and looks and she's been given a copy. She's told to copy from a copy. She goes and says, why am I copying from a copy? Uh, she, the mother superior says, ah, you're one of those troublemakers. So you can go to the library and find the original if you want. So she goes off, starts copying. After three days, she keeps running, you know, comes running out screaming, saying, Somebody has made a mistake. It's supposed to be celebrate, not celebrate. <laughs> so if you drop one letter, it can make a huge difference. So one thing that's supposed to have happened is that all the primates have a spine in the penis, whereas humans are the only primate with a spineless penis. So one of the controller genes was lost along the way, and we lost the spine. So, sorry, ladies. Um, so what is intelligence then? So humans evolved along the way, they learned to build tools, the brain got sharper, the brain got bigger, uh, diets changed, shortened the gut actually when you went to high protein diet, the gut got shorter, that released more energy for the brain to grow, and so on and so on. So what is intelligence in this context? How much time do you have? said he has more than one hour talks, I should leave him. <laughs> so, Intelligence is not very well defined, but uh, there are lots of indications of intelligence. Like the bumblebee actually solves what is called a traveling salesman problem as it goes from flower to flower, which means it visits one flower only once. It doesn't go back to the same flower. So genetically, it has evolved this intelligence, and it's a vertical evolution. It, does, it cannot teach uh, another bumblebee how to do that. They have just developed this over time. And there are lots of examples like siskins to the bird. They observed that the, the females were picking the male bird with a long yellow feather and they didn't know why. And they hit some seeds with uh, toothpicks and they found that the birds with the long uh, yellow feather actually much more intelligent and they were, they were able to get this seed out. So the females had evolved to pick smarter males by looking at the feathers. Uh, but on the other hand, peacocks, male peacocks carry this ornate that has no utilitarian value, and females pick a male that has at least average number of eyes. They don't care if it's above average, but if it's below average, they don't like it. So there is some vanity involved in there. Is that intelligence? Maybe. Uh, cats have evolved to basically flip the drink as they drink by curling their tongues in such a way that they don't get their whiskers wet at all, compared to dogs which are just sloppy. Right? So cats have evolved this intelligence, but what is it for? It's just vanity, right? But as Hezi was saying, intelligence is not necessary to control even the environment. With dark daisies and white daisies, with the temperature dependence growth rate, they can control their environment. So intelligence in that sense is not very precisely defined. It can be an evolutionary trait. But on the other hand, if you look at uh, things like dolphins, uh, last few years, they have seen that dolphins are trying to learn uh, to walk on water, like a dance. And it's not being done for anything other than fun. But they have seen that dolphins are teaching each other how to do this. So this is considered an advanced level intelligence where you learn something. You know, you can teach a dog a trick, but a dog cannot teach another dog the same trick. Whereas dolphins are able to learn something on their own and teach it to another dolphin. It's a bit advanced. And so getting slowly to the brain, cats have a smaller brain for their body mass. They're independent, they're socially isolated, they like to be alone. Whereas dogs, which are very friendly, have a relatively bigger brain by body mass. Okay? And they are also emotional, they have lots of emotional response and so on. So all these animals, especially mammals, have something called the amygdala. Okay, which comes from the word for am. Amygdala is essentially what defines the elephant. Remember I said the rider and the elephant? Amygdala is what converts your emotional experience into a, uh, a, a, 
or a, a, a physical experience to an experience into an emotional response. This is what is involved in fear. So it's related to basically everything you can think of. How the mind uh, perceives risk, how it responds to risk. If you have a bigger than normal amygdala, you tend to be very social. When you see Boris going to a bar and being friendly to all the girls, you know that he has a bigger amygdala. Okay. But on the other hand, a bigger amygdala doesn't mean they are happy. So maybe he goes home and cries. But nonetheless, amygdala makes your social network generally bigger. And they found with experiments with monkeys that actually if you artificially increase their social network, the amygdala response and gets bigger. So they have also found that Buddhists have developed this technique where they use meditation to make their amygdala bigger. This increases your empathy and sympathy and makes you more compassionate. So this is essentially, it's related to how artistic you are, whether you are gay or not, whether you are a good mother or not, and so on. So amygdala is essentially what makes the human mind the uh, elephant part of it, the emotional part of it. So, if you take that now and add other complications of intelligence among other things, ants are the most organized, they are almost like humans. They literally build underground cities, very complicated structures, and they fight wars, they are very cooperative, they even enslave, the losers of the war are enslaved by the winners, and they even use chemical weapons. And they use leaves to collect water and grow fungi for food, so they do some kind of agriculture. And they domesticate aphids for honey. So ants do pretty much everything humans do. But what is, what is one thing you can think of that they don't do that humans do? Squash ants. They can't squash other ants, right? But they also don't have summer school, probably. <laughs> so we can do symbolic language. I can stand here and describe something to you, imaginary, that you have never seen. But you can sit there and imagine it. So we're able to communicate. We have this shared intelligence. Somebody builds a computer. I don't know how to build a computer, but I know how to use it to make a living out of it. So we have this capability to have uh, this incredible so-called non-zero arrangement where you can make a deal where we both benefit and you can have infinite combinations of these. So this is kind of a, not just vertical genetic evolution, but it's also a cultural evolution. So we have a lot of the cultural values that we pass on. And it's not just from parents. You can have oblique from teachers, or you can have horizontal from friends, or by looking at what Steve Jobs did and trying to emulate his success. So we, had, we learn in so many ways. So our brain is clearly off the chart in terms of the scaling of body weight versus brain weight. There are animals with big brain, but not, they're not necessarily as intelligent as we are. You can see how far off we are uh, from the line. So there is something unique uh, among human beings in terms of our ability to share intelligence. This is what makes us the most cooperative species. And this is related to a lot of the dietary changes that happened along the way in the last million years. We went to a more uh, protein, high protein diet and so on. As I said, it shortened our gut. And it has changed the, the secretion in our brain. If you imagine all the stress, fight and flight kind of uh, hormones, you have neurotransmitters and uh, neuromodulators and neurohormones and so on. So you have things like dopamine and uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and testosterone and serotonin and so on and so on. And they all make you do certain things. And you can evoke those responses depending on how you communicate. Come on in. Right? I think you like it. So, oxytocin is one of those things that is called a cuddle hormone or a love hormone, which makes you feel secure and feel good. In fact, when they use the oxytocin uh, spray on kids in a dorm, the kids started to give away money to their friends. But it has a side effect. It also makes you fearless and be protective of people who are close to you. So you are nicer to the people who are us, and they are more protective against them. And Paul Ehrlich would argue that this us versus them extends to about 150 people. So if you give anybody a phone book, or you would do Google or whatever, 
everybody had a group of about 150 very close friends and relatives. Beyond that, it becomes harder to communicate or be close. And this should be taken into account in a, a model like the agent-based model, because what you do depends on how it affects the people you consider us. Right? But there are two angles to it. You could be sitting in front of a TV and you see that there's a very bad flood or earthquake or a cholera outbreak in Haiti or something. And we are able to take out a wallet and send money because we feel some empathy. So you can have these uh, neurotransmitters or hormones being released, proteins being synthesized based on emotional response to visual cues or physical experiences, again going back to the amygdala or the elephant. Okay? So the brain is, is in that sense very complicated. So if you want to do the cognitive modeling, then the, the cerebellum and the brain stem take care of the basically autonomic functions like breathing and heart rate and balancing and locomotion and so on. But it's the elephant part, the neocortex, which makes us so uh, high thinkers, is also responsible for a lot of the negative things we do. But as I said, we have intrinsic values that can be reached with proper communication. And it's also related to things like this that are still not very well understood, but still work through the amygdala, where if you are an adult and speaking full-time multi-languages, at least two languages, then you're using the executive part of the, uh, the brain that makes you less susceptible to things like Alzheimer's, so the protein synthesis goes on for much longer, and it makes you much better at multitasking. So just teach your kids at least two languages. Right? So the human brain is very complicated, but it can be understood, it can be modulated by things like meditation. Obviously there is better living through chemicals always, but they tend to have side effects and so on. So what else do we need? Do we need altruism? Is altruism evolutionarily stable or is it evolutionarily unstable? You see a lot of altruistic behavior in the natural world, right? They make friends, they develop cooperation, the prairie dogs uh, evolve for each other, they protect food, and of course are very uh, cooperative and so on. <clears throat> and the evolutionary biologists always debate this because Richard Dawkins would say that's just part of the genetic uh, replication. So you are just trying to propagate your own genes, that's it. So it's put in the context of inclusive fitness or kid selection, or group selection, multi-level selection and so on. But among humans, it turns out that actually uh, altruism can be taught either from the parents or from societal interactions. Uh, in the early childhood, you have a lot of Aesop's fables and so on about being charitable, being good, why it's important to be good and so on. Uh, religion does that to some extent question whether it does more damage than good, but nonetheless, since it's a learned behavior, it also can be lost, right? But if you look at other uh, important things like the tragedy of the commons, how many of you heard of the tragedy of the commons? Who has never heard of tragedy? Lady has never heard of it. Why did you hire her? Tragedy of the commons is essentially where you have a pasture that's shared by uh, uh, let's say multiple farmers, and they can buy as many cattle as they want to graze uh, the common pasture. But if nobody cares and they keep on buying uh, more and more cows, essentially then the pasture is not enough for everybody. So individual interest in this case can hurt the group interest, right? Are we doomed to the tragedy of the commons because atmosphere is a global common? If you pollute here, everybody is going to be affected. So are we just doomed for it? Is it evolutionarily ingrained in us? It turns out that even the parasites actually don't do the tragedy of the commons in terms of being most virulent. So if you have multiple parasites affecting, attacking a host, then if they only worry about themselves, then it's an energy loss in the host. Whereas it turns out that actually they are not trying to maximize virulence or just trying to take care of themselves, they do avoid the tragedy of the commons. And it turns out that uh, Eleanor Orson's work has shown in Africa and so on, with simple norms and punishments, you can make the human beings easily avoid the tragedy of the commons. So human beings have in them to 
basically look at norms and internalize them and make it almost a preference. So if you have a rule that you have to stop at red light, even if you're driving at midnight and there is a red light and there is nobody around, especially no police around, most people still tend to stop when the green light comes. Right? But this is a norm that has been internalized into a preference. So it's very easy to create. And then there are cultural dimensions to it in the sense that cultures that have faced adversity and resource limitation tend to be better at setting up norms and punishments to avoid the tragedy of the commons. We are able to be incredibly cooperative at very large scales and we are able to make the non-zero arrangements between ourselves to benefit both parties. Then how do we go back to solving something like the global warming problem? Right? So here is uh, an example of the ecological footprint versus human development index, which basically includes uh, life, uh, you know, the life expectancy, education, uh, women's health, children's health, and so on. And you can see that a lot of the rich, almost all of the rich countries have gotten a high human development index by having a very high ecological footprint. Cuba is the only one that meets the criteria for sustainability, but I'm not sure we want to make the whole world look like Cuba. Nonetheless, the question is, these poor countries, if they have to move up here, do they have to go this way and come this way, or is there a way to move this way? What does this, you know, are, are these countries ever going to move here? How will we do that? How would you make IPCC negotiations or whatever other framework you have to move everybody here and move them here? That's not very easy. But that's what you want your physical climate models, the ATP models, and cognitive models to work together find the solutions in terms of policies, usage of common resources, and so on, to get here without going too far out here. Okay? That's kind of the challenge you have to face. So, going back to the elephant, as I said, you have to find a way, whatever you're trying to communicate, you have to motivate the rider, and you have to kind of shape the path for the elephant to move in the right direction. And if you try to cheat the elephant, this is what happens. So here is the elephant walking. There's a car coming the other way and trying to pass the elephant. The elephant doesn't like it, and this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be careful because this is important. Because if you keep preaching gloom and doom in the name of climate change, then human willpower is a, it, it's an exhaustible resource. People just have fatigue after a while they will stop listening to you. So the message has to be positive. And I will show, I, uh, I've included a long list of uh, links which give you a vision of the future. How do we, what the future would look like if we did the right thing. Instead of saying everything will go to hell if we do this, how about we say if we do the right thing, this is what we can look forward to. So you can look up those uh, websites. But you should also be careful that some politicians, especially, and even some scientists, fake the elephant. They look in your eyes and say, I understand your pain. But sometimes it's not a real elephant. It's a, it's a fake elephant. <laughs> you have to be careful with that. <laughs> so the message I would like to give, maybe I will give a few minutes for Parish, but I will show a couple more. So, tragedy of the commons is not at all necessary, I think. If we do the right thing, use your APD model correctly and produce good solution, uh, we can avoid the, the tragedy of the commons. And Earth is like a spaceship, so right? we're hurtling around in space, and it's like an airplane. Rich countries cannot, even though there will be some winners and losers, actually you cannot protect yourself forever if you create disaster in one place, whether it's environmental migration or disease or whatever it is. So it's like an airplane. If it crashes, the first class is not going to be any safer than the economy. Probably everybody will get hurt, right? So we have to really think like that. Plus, if you think of it like an insurance, 
you know, if you do energy independence, rainforest sustainability, and so on. We don't just really need a reason to do that. Biodiversity is beautiful. We should preserve it because it's beautiful. That's what our intrinsic value would say. So, what if it's a whole big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Is that really going to be a problem? Probably not. Right? So, act as if you are here to stay and be good to the earth. There are other, these are the, the websites, as Buckminster Fuller said, we're called to be architects of the future, not its victims. So the future is actually in our hands. We can create a good future. And you can look up these uh, websites. They're very good in terms of giving you a vision for uh, the future. There's a bunch of them. There are some inspirational ones. Uh, there are some that are focused on solutions and so on. And oh, this is actually <laughs> Uh, I'll just kind of show you the, uh, this is uh, some work from uh, Dave, uh, Herman Daly, you should read that, it's really nice. Uh, some game changer will come, up, come along, depending on, you know, if you're looking for renewable energy, for example, if you follow the research that's going on in improving solar cells, for example, within a millimeter, they're able to now produce uh, energy at 40-50%. If you think of plants, they're harvesting light at 2% efficiency, and everything on, uh, on Earth, all life on Earth, depends essentially on this solar energy that's being captured by the plants at 2% efficiency. So it's not really energy limitation if we know how to create it from this energy that's coming in all the time on Earth. So some game changer might come along, and this is the example of telegraphy and how a fridge was invented. It has affected so many things in terms of new invention. So that's one of the visions for the future. But in terms of the uh, elephant and the rider, I put a few slides in the back that you can look at. The rider loves to contemplate, analyze, and doing so has a negative bias, almost always focusing on problems rather than solutions. I would argue that this is what the scientists are doing. They are not giving people solutions. If you keep telling everybody that you are screwed, and when they ask, what can I do to get unschooled, and you have no good answer other than change your light bulb, then you're not doing a good job of communicating. Right? That's the rational mind, that's the neocortex, that's the high thinking. The elephant is easily spooked and hates doing things with no immediate benefits. It's stubborn, needs reassurance, and it's quickly be more light. So the few who are grad students, you know what that means. Right? But it's powerful, powerless, and difficult to actively direct. Exactly like a crack. <laughs> you get them drinking and they will never stop. So anyway, I think that's the message I wanted to give. I want to leave some time for questions. If you want to make them British nervous, please ask me questions for 10 minutes. <laughs> yes? Yeah, uh, There's all this problem you talked about this about the Humans, psychological inertia, something like that, without not much change. But in the end, the world of a lot of the economies, and even the people are bi-rational, there's still a balance of the costs to change and the sacrifice of continue doing this. You know, there's a it's like game theory. If you're in the situation is that if the cost of change is much higher, then we continue doing this. The law, the loss of oil gas continue doing this, then the people are still going to continue, but not change. So this is really the economics people describe all these actions because that we don't change. Some some in some um, cases for the students when doing the examinations they don't reveal too much but until the very end of the examination they focus on themselves. So what do you think of this here? Yeah, I mean you have to are you an economist? No. Okay. I, and the old joke is that God made economists to make the meteorologists look better. No. <laughs> you shouldn't never be an economist. But it's lawyers, no? Huh? It's about lawyers, no? Yeah. God made lawyers to make the economists look better. Uh, but that's what I said about the risk perception in the beginning. The mind is always weighing costs, but this can be affected by the mental model you have, right? You may have never met me, but you may have heard from somebody that I'm not a nice guy. So your interaction with me may be affected by what created a mental model based on 
information that's secondhand or maybe wrong. So the cost in this case is, let's say, global warming. If we don't say what is the benefit for the future, then that's what I'm, I'm saying, give a vision for the future. So the cost is not a, it's not a monolithic thing, it's not a fixed thing, it's relative. Right? So every mind is perceiving risk, but this risk depends on the mental model that created. And all the climate contrarians have used this to create <coughs> myths about climate always changes, this is nothing new, so we shouldn't worry. And then the scientist responds by saying, no, you have to worry, the world will come to an end. I'm saying most people have intrinsic values that can be reached if you give them cost-benefit analysis and tell them that the cost of change is not big in this case. Literally like saying you can create a better world or, you know, create a, a, this R2, this really, you know. So, we can do these things without actually damaging the economy or getting poor. The myth is that these, doing these will somehow crash the economy. But somebody will come along, if you look at the prices uh, in auto industry in the US, Japan did not face this crisis. They had hybrids, everything going, they were doing this fine. US industry had ignored these technologies and now they are trying to get into it. So they created a mental model for themselves and this technology is not ready for that. So the cost is not <coughs> something that is absolute and deterministic. It can change depending on Right now, fossil fuel is expensive, it's cheap. This is why renewable energy is not being developed. But if you exhaust fossil fuel, then the human mind will try to do something. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Are you sure about uh, this is a common uh, perception? I mean, uh, this one? Yeah. This is a joke. Yeah, I know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line of the joke is that everyone thinks that if uh, the world is the ecosystem uh, flourishing, they see a benefit from it. But I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure it's a cause that everyone are willing to, to see as a not legitimate, but something they want. Because if you look at people... You are saying people, not everybody thinks it's a hope. So. Not, not to the level that uh, they will put any effort in really. People don't want to do this. Yes. Yes. But that's, I think that's the. But this is your. This is your intrinsic. Uh, this is exactly my point. You are. You have a mental model, which is not based on enough data, right? So I'm saying, how do we get beyond this mental model? You are thinking. This is called dispositional and contextual behavior. When you are speeding, if somebody speeds next to you. They're going faster than you. You think, oh, people are so stupid. Whereas I'm speeding because I have, I've been late for a meeting or whatever. You think your behavior is disposition, it's contextual, so you are doing wrong things only because it's necessary, but other people do wrong things because that's just the way they are. Right? That's what you're saying. But I'm saying that's not the case. Behavior can be very contextual, and you can reach with proper communication the intrinsic values. And it, I'm not saying exactly how to do it, but it can start with the kids. The kids why are kids not taught to just appreciate biodiversity? Right? So I'm saying human mind has the ability to do it. It's up to us how to do it. So I'm not convinced that everybody is out to get the plan. Nobody is anything. Yeah. Right? So when, they were hunt when we were hunter gatherers, we had a very small environmental footprint. But as soon as agriculture became domesticated, we became a sedentary society. Even fertility rates went up because the child care became better. Communities got bigger and bigger, and environmental footprint got bigger and bigger. And now you are far removed from where the food production happens. You're sitting in your office and running APB models, and the farmer is producing the food. You have no concept of what climate change can do food production. So this disconnect is often uh, Ebert Nordhaus or whatever. There's a German sociologist and there is some medical evidence for this that the dopamine levels in human beings have 
continuously increased, so we have become more and more reward-seeking species. You know, our behavior is very driven by this token energy, and it affects cultural behavior, and uh, French uh, social scientist called Emile Durkheim called it anomie. How do you say it long? Okay, so I don't think it's a fixed thing. It's too you have to focus on the positive. We are a species, not because of the difference. We are a species because of the common character. I think one of the problems with dealing with uh, communicating climate science is that is the spatial and temporal scales of this problem. And most people uh, think that climate is something that con God con God's control, and I'm so tiny, and climate change is going to happen in 50 years, 100 years, so why am I going to do any effort? In there, is, there is another talk that I could give on that, that we have screwed ourselves basically by doing that. Everybody watches weather forecast and makes decisions based on this. What to wear, what, you know, whether to carry an umbrella, whether to go on vacation, because there is credibility in the forecast. And then we jump to 50 or 100 year projections which are actually very uncertain when I am okay. So we should have gone to the bridge in two weeks season, establish credibility there, then say in three years, ten years, what happens. In much of South Asia where I work, all the problems are now. If you don't solve this, it doesn't matter what happens in 2030. Well, that's essentially right? yeah. but the human mind aspect of this that they do find people who are, they were put in front of a mirror, those who, and they were shown an uh, aged picture of themselves. And those who believe that, yes, that's me in 30 years, invest in the future better than those who say, nah, that's not me. But there are people who cannot perceive beyond a certain time. So this is related again to this brain structure and so on and so on. So it is cognitive, but they can be reached it doesn't have to be 2050, but the future. And it turns out that people who have kids are not necessarily more worried about global warming than people who don't have kids. So people do have a problem of seeing too far into the future and investing in the future. They discount the future very heavily. It's just like you are much happier, I mean, you are much sadder when you lose five dollars than you are happy when you find ten dollars. The human mind has all these perception of so it's right, but I'm saying if you give a vision for the future, that problem is kind of almost solved. That's not what we're doing very well. That's it? Okay.